Welcome to Tell Me About East Asia, a podcast presented by the Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Arizona. The Center for East Asian Studies is a Title VI National Resource Center supported by the U.S. Department of Education. We assist and promote the study of East Asian languages and cultures across Southern Arizona and beyond. This episode is the first part of the local portion of China Town Hall 2024. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you again for joining our Arizona portion of uh, the Chinatown Hall this year. Um, and we just heard the national portion of the seminar of the webinar. And now we are very fortunate to have Frank Hawk as our local um, speaker slash moderator. And because we're taking the virtual for, form format, um, we're going to ask you to type your questions in the chat box. And I'm going to read those questions to, uh, to Frank, and then we will have discussions. And so before we start, um, in case um, you don't know me yet, my name is Wen Hao Diao. Uh, I am the co-director for the, at the Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Arizona. Um, when we saw the Chinatown Hall partners, uh, we actually noticed that quite a few of the, the different localities were actually hosted with, uh, by our partners uh, in many of the CIS events. So please, um, if you haven't yet, please subscribe to our CIS newsletters and also our social media. Um, and there are a lot of opportunities for events and, op uh, and other, um, we actually have quite a few things coming up just next week. And so also allow me to briefly introduce Frank Hawk. Um, until recently, Frank Hawk was the China director for the Stanford University Graduate School of Business based at the Stanford Center at Peking University. Previously, he was Asia Regional Director for the International Potato Center, an international research and development NGO that focuses on food security and poverty reduction, and the chairman, Greater China of uh, Crow Associates, as well as an independent consultant assisting companies with business strategies in China. In the early 1980s, Frank assisted numerous firms conclude landmark early deals in China, including the Great Wall Hotel, China's first joint, event, uh, joint venture, and the Beijing Jeep Corporation. He worked for Citibank from 1988 to 1994, managing business in the People's Republic of China and Taiwan, and he headed a team that re-established Citibank in Vietnam. From 1994 to 1997, Frank was head of investment banking for Solomon Brothers China. Frank has served as an independent director on the boards of China Everbright Bank, JP Morgan Chase China, and Sun Life Everbright Insurance Company, a large state-owned financial services firm. He also served as an independent director on the board of Khan Bank, Mongolia's largest commercial bank. Frank has taught extensively at Stanford, and he currently teaches at Peking University and the Beijing Center for Chinese Studies, the Jesuit, the Jesuit Study in China Center. And welcome, Frank. Uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks uh, for the kind introduction. Um, I would only add that I'm uh, also a proud uh, fourth generation Southern Arizonan and uh, graduate of Saguaro High School here in Tucson. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Arizona for hosting this, I think, important event. And in particular, uh, Wang Hao, you and, and your colleagues for inviting me to participate. I'm, I'm greatly honored. Um, today, we heard from what I would call an, an architect of U.S.-China relations. Uh, there are many architects of U.S.-China relations in the halls of power and academia in both China and the U.S., Sadly, perhaps fortuitously, I am not one of them. Rather, I am what I would call a practitioner of U.S.-China relations. Uh, my entire adult life has been spent in and around China. My financial exposure to China, um, in terms of how I have made a living for the past 45 years, and where a large portion of my financial assets were located until recently, has been enormous. My beautiful wife was born and raised in Beijing, 
and her entire family is in China. Our sons are completely bilingual and bicultural with grandparents, aunts, uncles, uh, and cousins on both sides of the Pacific. We have long lasting and deep friendships with people in both countries. We, we practitioners, and, and that includes corporations, by the way, we have to live and work in the house of US-China relations that the architects designed for us. Uh, with that in mind, and in an effort to provoke some discussion, I want to address two common and unhelpful viewpoints that I frequently hear among the architects and some practitioners on both sides. These viewpoints share two problems in my view. One is that each is flawed uh, in its formulation. And the second is that each is unhelpful in addressing the issues in the bilateral relationship. Time is limited, so I will cover each quickly. We can return to them in Q&A if, if, if there's an interest. The US and China each suffers from what I call a chip on its shoulder. Uh, that is a perceived grievance so great that it can cloud objectivity and distort behavior. The Chinese chip or grievance in my view is that China was for most of pre-modern history, the largest economy in the world and the apotheosis of human civilization until the Westerners came along with their superior technology that they lucked into and subjugated not only China, but much of the rest of the world. Thus, by 1949, when the Chinese Communist Party successfully reunited China and expelled the imperialists from Chinese soil, China was an economic basket case and a cultural backwater. China, therefore, in its view, is entitled to restoration to its rightful place as a global power. And the so-called West is dedicated, in their view, to containing China and preventing it from doing so. Geopolitically, China fully intends to become a regional and then a global power. Virtually all Chinese at all levels believe this is China's birthright. It's axiomatic. Why is this flawed? Well, first, in the pre-modern world, population was the main generator of economic growth, power, and status. For numerous reasons that world historians debate endlessly, for the past 2,000 years, the gravitational pull of a single united China has generally overcome the centrifugal forces attempting to pull China apart. Europe, for equally interesting and hotly debated reasons, saw centrifugal forces overpower gravitational forces over the same period, leading to a perennially divided European continent. A simple outcome of this, and the fact that China developed an effective policy polity as well, is China overwhelmingly had the largest population in the world during the pre-modern period, and therefore the largest economic surplus with which to underwrite a flourishing culture. And here's the flaw. The world doesn't work that way anymore. Since the advent of the Industrial Revolution and modern economic growth, defined as sustained growth in per capita GDP, economic power and status are determined much more by innovation and effective governance than by the traditional drivers of land, labor, and capital. In terms of governance alone, one need only compare Russia and Singapore to understand this. The second flaw in this grievance in this grievance narrative is the US and the West more broadly until very recently has not only not sought to contain China, but has been the single greatest facilitator of China's rise other than the Chinese people. More on that in a moment. This is my plea as a practitioner of US-China relations to the, to the Chinese architect, to the Chinese architects of US-China relations. The world owes you nothing. Shed these flawed grievances and associated paranoia and focus on becoming a constructive player in a system that yes, you did not create, and yes, not all of the rules favor only you yet which has been a critical facilitator for your historically unprecedented rise and which can continue to be so. The American chip or grievance is that China shows insufficient gratitude to the US and the so-called US-led rules-based order for China's achievements. Some recent historical context I think is useful here. In early, in early 1979, when I first arrived in China, 
China accounted for roughly 24% of global population and just over 1% of global GDP. Think about that for a moment. That right there is a pretty good definition of poverty. It was in December of 1978 that Deng Xiaoping, in recognition of China's dire straits, promulgated his new program of reform and opening up. The essence of the program was everything, including foreign policy, had to serve the goal of rapid economic development. What this meant was China would not rock the boat globally by challenging the U.S., and China would stop fomenting revolution and make friends regionally. All of this was necessary, in Deng's view, to attract the capital, technology, and know-how necessary for China's rapid catch-up, for it has been and still is all about catching up. Deng's policy can be summed up by the well-known Chinese catchphrase, Tao Guang Yang Hui, meaning hide one's capacities and bide one's time. This was the essence of Deng Xiaoping's foreign policy. Deng's intent was not to shelve permanently China's ambition to be a world power, as just mentioned, an ambition shared by the elites and the masses in China, but rather to delay that ambition until China possessed the economic and military wherewithal to achieve that ambition. By virtue of the efforts of the Chinese people and with the support of the so-called rules-based global order mentioned above, China has made great strides economically. This is well documented. Hundreds of millions of Chinese have been lifted out of poverty. The U.S. and its partners among the so-called developed countries have been the greatest external facilitators of China's rise, not Russia, not North Korea, not Iran. It was not a coincidence that at the same time Deng announced his reform and opening program in December of 1978, that he, along with President Jimmy Carter, announced the resumption of diplomatic ties between the U.S. and China, and perhaps more important, uh, the beginning of scholar exchanges, which inaugurated a veritable gold rush of Chinese students and scholars to the U.S., predominantly to study STEM fields, and take their knowledge and skills back to China to support economic reform. Deng was fully aware that Chinese economic reform was a dead letter without support from the U.S. and the rest of the West, which, were, which we were happy to provide. Fast forward to the end of the 20th century, and we again find the U.S. as China's biggest external facilitator, as China's sponsor for membership in the WTO, which drastically reduced impediments to China's exports uh, entering WTO member countries, and which drove China's GDP growth to near double-digit rates for almost a decade. Additionally, the U.S. opened its deep capital markets to Chinese firms seeking equity capital to support growth. Much of this capital has been supplied by ordinary U.S. citizens through pension funds. The U.S. also supported inclusion of the renminbi in the IMF special drawing rights or SDR basket of currencies as a show of support to China's financial reformers. These are just some examples of ways in which the U.S. led rules-based order has played a critical role in facilitating China's rise. Nobody else could have done it. Many in the West are therefore left wondering at China's pivot to a more aggressive foreign policy that seems to break the foundational rules of the Dungist policy. Now China seems perfectly happy challenging the U.S. at a regional and a global level, and it seems perfectly content to alienate regional players, while at the same time cozying up to actors that contributed little or nothing to its successful rise. What happened? Why is China so ungrateful? I have my own theory, but time doesn't permit discussing it here. But why is this oft-expressed U.S. grievance flawed? The first is not so much a flaw as a reality check. The benefits of China's rise have not flowed in a single direction. The U.S. and West also benefited in numerous ways, not the least of which were long periods of low prices and low interest rates. Time doesn't permit a full discussion of all of the ramifications of China's rise, but it is sufficient to say the U.S. has benefited enormously from China's rise, including being the beneficiary of China's enormous brain drain. Second, to echo the discussion of China's grievances, the past is the past. 
we live in a new world. To quote the classic broker's lament, past performance is no guarantee of future results. So this is my plea as a practitioner of U.S.-China relations to the U.S. architects. China owes us nothing. We cannot nor should we attempt to stop China's rise. We should continue to channel China's rise within the existing system which has been so beneficial to China over the past 46 years and which continue to, can continue to be so. Cooperate where we can, resist and constrain where we must by ma maintaining alliances and building coalitions. Above all, we must demonstrate to China and others that constructive participation in the global system, system can be and should be a positive sum game. I'll stop here. Uh, I see that we have a lot of China expertise on the call. Uh, so I look forward to having a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, I don't know if I agree with everything you've said, but good, I will good, good. I will make sure that we get the audience questions first. Good. Um, so um, we had a question from uh, Eleanor Birmingham um, and the question during the, the national webinar. And the question is, what do military maneuvers in the South China Sea do for the U.S.? They do nothing for the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think they create, as I just said, um, this is just one example of the switch from the Dungas foreign policy of, of trying to create a, an environment within which China can focus on economic, economic development to a different foreign policy, it seems, where the Chinese government no longer seems to be concerned about that. And uh, this, what's going on in the South China Sea is simply one example of, of that seemingly transformation of China's foreign policy. Um, and it's, it's seen certainly by the U.S. and other nations in, in the region as highly provocative. Uh, it actually violates uh, an international uh, a court uh, judgment against China in this regard. And so I, I think it's one of these things that simply is an indicator of this pivot of China's foreign policy uh, from the Dungan's foreign policy to the new, new regime's foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And the next question, I think that was raised um, because during the national webinar, um, uh, Deputy Secretary Kurt Campbell talked about, got a question about, you know, um, Taiwan and mainland China, right? And so the question is, what happened to our former lip service to the One China Agreement? Uh, I, I think it's still in place. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. my understanding of the U.S. government's official position is that uh, uh, we still adhere to the original Shanghai communique of 1972, in which the U.S. recognizes that both sides of the China Strait, of the Taiwan Strait, uh, believe there's one China um, and that Taiwan's part of China. My understanding is official U.S. government policy has not changed in that regard. Yeah, I think that's my understanding as well. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? Uh, you may actually, um, I don't know if you're a able to unmute yourself but feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question or you know if if you prefer to type in the in the chat I'm just uh giving folks a little bit more time to type questions or we're trying to unmute uh, we do have quite a few people who are joining us so if you would like to um, ask a question just just start to speak so that we know do we have any questions from the audience well, well, how you said you have some issues. Let's get let's get into it. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, I I very much I think largely I I very much agree with you that there needs to be more collaboration. There needs to be because it's it's mutually beneficial, as you have said. I do feel that I do not completely agree with you on the analysis of of China's success in the past. Even though you did say that the past is not necessarily the, the future. I, I would like to say that, you know, that you you said that China's sentiment is that that China was, um, you know, a, 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 at least a regional power for a very long time. Right. Um, and, and you seem to contribute or attribute that to the population alone. And I'm not sure if I completely agree with that assessment, because um, 
because we do know that you know China also had a lot of innovation in the in its history, both not just scientifically but also you know culturally, politically as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 No. Okay. Let me clarify. My, I, I totally agree with you, and 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 I, I I'm, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry if I gave the opposite impression that the, that it was less complex than it really was. <laughs> and just let me go back to my original comments. Um, first of all, I, I focused on you know for society to be able to achieve what China did achieve, uh, and I and I said in my comments that it was the apotheosis of human civilization. For a couple of thousand years, right? So I, I did give China tremendous credit in that regard. But the reason they were able to achieve that was through having a, uh, an economy and able to achieve economic surplus to support that level of, of cultural achievement. It requires a certain amount of, you know, two things economic development, which at that time in, in world history is driven, really driven by population, but also as I was very careful to state and also the development of a polity mm. a set of political institutions right uh which china is famous for uh it, it, all you have to read is reads francis fukuyama in his recent two volume history of, of chinese of, of political development in the world he himself you know says china was the first to achieve this complex political uh, sort of polity mm -hmm. which per, which would permit it therefore to sustain this economic uh, uh, surplus and then channel it into the ways you talk about, into innovation, into this sort of, you know, cultural efflorescence mm -hmm. that again, you know, was, was the, you know, was the envy of the world for, mm -hmm. for, for a long time. So you and I have, have zero disagreement in this regard. I, I think maybe I just maybe underplayed it a little bit uh, in my comments. That's fine. We actually have quite a few questions now. Um, so uh, I think we have Maria Morgan first, uh, Maria Morgan first, and then Albert. Yes, well, next. before Maria says anything, let me just say, I just mentioned there's a lot of China expertise on this call. She's one of them. Uh, okay. Maria, Maria has a PhD in political science from Stanford University and taught Chinese, Chinese politics for decades. So Maria, how are you doing? I'm fine. I have no expertise and therefore I have a question. <laughs> Do you worry if Trump get re-elected, that he will unilaterally recognize Taiwan's independence? Uh, no, I do not. Um, uh, I, I think, and I have, I have no personal, I, haven't, I, I don't know Donald Trump, I'm not involved in this campaign. <laughs> uh, my, 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 my guess is, by virtue of having been president once, uh, that he's familiar with the issues around Taiwan and, and, and the mainland, and it's has probably educated himself about them. And and I think if that has slipped in some fashion in the in the interim, if he's president again, he will be reeducated in this regard. And, and this th this gets me to a, I think a general point about the role of China in in U.S. electoral politics. China is is one of those issues on which. Democrats and Republicans tend to come together <laughs> and agree on. Uh, China bashing is a is a favorite uh, activity of both Democrats and Republicans during what people call you know the silly season um, of electoral politics, and, and so there's a history of of especially the non incumbent uh, uh, candidate bashing the incumbent on being too soft on China, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then inevitably what happens if, if the non-incumbent gets elected, he gets into power and then he understands the, the, the issues better and the experts talk to him and then he, he falls in line to essentially what has been the policy for some time. So that, that's just sort of a history of, 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 of the role of China in electoral politics. But no, I mean, without any personal knowledge or anything, I, I, I don't think Donald Trump would, would recognize an independent Taiwan. And quite frankly, my view is the Shanghai communique uh, and and subsequent legislation in the United States commits us to the defense of Taiwan only under the original supposition that both sides of the Taiwan Strait agree that there's one China and Taiwan's part of China. Uh, and, and my personal view is, and I, I would hope a view being expressed to, to the Taiwanese, maybe sub rosa, is that if you if if you declare independence, that that's gone, I and mean, that's our commitment 
was not based on that. It was based on something else. Um, but that's just, again, my personal view. Yeah, and Albert um, also has a question. Another person with tremendous China expertise. Exactly. <laughs> so everyone well, else but, in the audience has I'm, more. I, I'm, I'm starting to get real humbled here. <laughs> no, 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 no. But but uh, maybe uh, some kind of experience, but of of uh, of centuries past. <laughs> Not so much of, of well, current. Okay. Well, given, given my age, I'm getting there too. I can talk about <laughs> I can talk about centuries past pretty soon. <laughs> anyway, anyway, lovely to see you, Frank, and wonderful to hear your perspective. I, I really enjoyed it, and I'm I wanted to get your thoughts in a little bit different direction because I mean, you and I we've observed the you know this is kind of more of a regional kind of question. It's not uh, uh, it's you know. Well, let me put it this way. I have some colleagues who say, you know, we, we've been we've been here before. We've seen this script before. And I know I was in Japan during the 80s when when we went through the Japan is number one phase. And Japan was, uh, um, well, there was lots of talk of Japan taking over the, the economic system and taking over the order. The... Um, um, the talk in Japan was uh, talking about the evolution of civilizations going from Pax Romana to Pax Britannica to Pax Americana and that, that it was inevitable that they were going to be at Pax Japonica. I mean, this seems like probably quaint talk at this time, but it was quite serious in the 1980s. They, uh, oh, I remember. I remember. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was and, – and, and, you know, there were a lot – there was lots of uh, – uh, so-called uh, lots of acrimony on both sides of the Pacific uh, about it. Um, the Japan bashing in the U.S. Um, and there were e equally vitriolic uh, kind of opinions being expressed in Japan. And so I have some colleagues who say, well, you know, uh, it, it, we've been here before. It's inevitable that China will kind of uh, fall in line, have to fall in line as Japan had. Now, I have my own opinions about this, but I, I wonder if you have any any thought on on this um, you know that that uh, th this idea that this is not a new phenomenon with uh, you know for the US in terms of its relationship with uh, powerful um, rising economic uh, forces in the Pacific region. Uh, I mean, Japan uh, became the number two economy in the world at that point in time, uh, right. with a much, you know, with a smaller population and a much smaller population than China, of course, and a smaller population right. than, than mm -hmm. even than the U.S. So, um, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on on, yeah. on this? Yeah. So, no, I, I think that, no, I think it's a great observation, um, and uh, just a personal anecdote is back in the '80s when you talked about. Uh, the rise of Japan and Japan kind of taking over the world and we're all going to be speaking Japanese in 20 years and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, I actually experienced that. I took a, a delegation from the first auto works in Changchun in, uh, in Jilin, uh, Jilin, China. Um, and uh, we were working with Chrysler on a potential technology transfer and we were being given a tour. The Chinese group was being given a tour through the the plant, uh, one of the Chrysler plants. And there was palpable antagonism from the workers on the line at Chrysler because they, 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 assumed, they, were Jap they assumed we were leading Japanese through the plant, not Chinese. And uh, there were remarks made. There was sullen looks you know, sent our way. And actually, a few times as we walked through, I said, you know, these are not Japanese. <laughs> these, are, these are Chinese people, right? And, and, and when I said it, people kind of visibly relaxed and, and weren't, weren't as hostile to those who were able to overhear me. So, yeah, I, 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 I remember those days and, and had some personal experience with them. Um, I, I believe that uh, the, the issue of falling in line, obviously, there's a great difference. Uh, Japan had to fall in line. We more or less told them to fall in line, and and they, they kind of they had no way to not to fall in line. There were voluntary export controls. Uh, they uh, 
you know, revalued the currency at the time uh, under U.S. pressure. And then the U.S. had levers it could pull that it doesn't have with China, clearly. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's one important difference. Also one important difference is uh, both China and Japan hit a wall economically uh, for different reasons. Um, in Japan's case, they hit the wall after they had become fairly affluent. Um, in China's case, they're hitting the wall and they're only at 25% of U.S. global GDP, of U.S. per capita GDP. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan was way above that when they hit their economic wall. Uh, and this is a huge, this is a huge problem for China. And it, it is connected to another problem that China has, and that it's its aging population. Um, China, Japan aged out, started aging out. In other words, uh, its its percentage of older retired people being a huge percentage of the population, they started aging out again after China was fairly uh, Japan was fairly affluent. In China, again, that's not happening. They're aging out again, at only 25% of U.S. per capita GDP. So the question was asked a long time ago is, uh, will China get rich before it gets old? Now, at the time that question was asked, you could already answer it, and the question was no. Uh, China is aging out at a much lower level of affluence than Japan did when it aged out. So that's a, another major difference with regard to the two economies. Now, I teach a course on the Chinese economy, and, uh, and I can tell you China is facing tremendous um, challenges uh, with its current economic growth model, which continues to be investment-driven and export-led, uh, as opposed to being driven by you know, 1.3 million consumers. Uh, Kurt Campbell just referenced that in his talk, uh, uh, referring to Janet Yellen's trip to, to, to Beijing recently. And, and trying to convince the Chinese, and the Chinese themselves have been saying this for 10 years. We're not trying to convince them to do something that they themselves don't believe they need to do. And that's to transition your economy from being investment-driven, export-led, to being consumer-driven, demand-driven, demand and, and service-driven. And the Chinese themselves have been saying this for years. They have refused to do it. Again, we could have an entire seminar on why that's happened. Um, but the China continues to try to export its model rather than change it. Uh, Belt and Road Initiative is a classic example of China trying to export demand uh, as opposed to creating it internally, exporting products uh, to other markets. Uh, is another example of trying to export their way out of the problem as opposed to changing the fundamental problem, address the fundamental problem of China's growth model being out of date and incredibly inefficient. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the basic problem of China's economy. It's terribly inefficient by all measures of what economists call total factor productivity, which is the measure of an economy's efficiency. China is extremely inefficient, getting less efficient. Thank you for listening. For the second part of China Town Hall 2024, please listen to the next episode. For more information about the center, please visit our website, ceas.arizona.edu.